Hi, my name is Will Harling. I'm the director of the Mid Klamath Watershed Council here in far northern California, and I'm excited to talk to you all about restoring fire processes in the Klamath Mountains to protect and restore critical salmon habitat. I'm lucky to work with an amazing group of people uh, up and down the Klamath River, kind of in between I-5 uh, near Wairika down to the confluence of the Trinity River. Um, for the past 20 years, the Mid Klamath Watershed Council has been working to build restoration based economies in the Western Klamath Mountains um, and, you know, working on combining traditional cultural knowledge with the best available Western science to get results on the ground. Uh, that's me on my dad's lap uh, at our cabin uh, on the McNeil Creek on the Salmon River. You can see uh, well, he's got his boot on one leg and his cast where he broke his leg logging on the other. This is about a, a year after the 1977 hog fire, the first mega fire burned right down behind our cabin. Uh, I was lucky enough to uh, have native friends like Holly Hincher there in the chair with me, who's now a social worker for the Kruk tribe and has been instrumental in bringing back ceremonies like the Ihuk, the, the women, girls coming of age ceremony with the Karuk tribe and, and to see through their eyes a different way of living in this place and to reflect on our own Western culture. Um, you know, that love of the land has translated for me into telling the, the fish's story, you know, as we enter climate change and their world starts to shrink and, and go away. Um, and for me, it, it's clear that until we figure out our fire problem, we're, we're not gonna be able to hold on to our fish here in the Southern range of salmon. You know, so many times I come across these incredible sites like these spawning coho and horse creek uh, and, and recognize these hot spots on the landscape for our threatened fish. And then literally, you know, the next year, uh, pretty much all of the horse creek drainage burned at high severity and uh, impacted a lot of our off channel pond habitats and other restoration projects. So the reality of fire on this landscape is one that we all have to deal with. And, and I'm sure many of you have, have encountered um, high severity fire on your landscape. You know, the reality is that the fish are, are trying to tell us something, you know, that, that we need to get it right and that we don't have a lot of time to do it. You know, with, with Mickwick, we work closely with the Cutter Tribes Fisheries Department to implement projects like the Syed Creek Channel Restoration Project there at the top and, and uh, worked with Columbia Helicopters and others to do helicopter wood loading projects and built over 20 off-channel ponds, uh, you know, and, and essentially what we've found in the past 20 years of doing river restoration is that many of the things we're putting back into these streams are the processes that that fire did naturally over time, back when we used to have cultural uh, ignitions and lightning ignitions working across the landscape without fire suppression. In this picture on Elk Creek, you can see uh, the, you know, the logs coming into the stream, the, the sediment coming into the stream, that would be the new spawning gravel and the, um, the biochar that you know, might accumulate on river bars downstream and grow those giant trees, those eight foot diameter trees that when they fall across the stream, you know, uh, back up sediment and reconnect floodplains and, and do amazing things uh, that we don't see anymore with our incised channels. You know, today we have high severity fires acting across the landscape after a century of fire exclusion and the cessation of indigenous burning. This is where I grew up on the Salmon River and the river below uh, this section on the North Fork of the Salmon was, was you know, unavailable to salmon for over a decade after because all the pools filled up with sediment and the water got a lot hotter. 
um, you know, in other places like Ryder Creek um, that burned hot in the 2014 fire, you know, one summer thunderstorm and the entire lower 20 miles of, of the creek filled up with sediment. And so our good coho streams, our, our last strongholds are blinking off. And it's not to say that, you know, in the future, um, there aren't some beneficial effects of, of these inputs of sediment after, uh, you know, so much fire exclusion. I mean, uh, in one day, Greider Creek got brought to stage zero and a lot of floodplains got connected, but uh, the impacts in the short term were severe. Similarly, there's impacts to the cessation of, of fire processes in our riparian corridors. You know, we see, um, you know, the streams get locked into place and in size, like here on Red Cap Creek that hasn't seen fire in over 110 years. Uh, it limits the amount of in-stream wood and spawning gravel. It cuts off the light for the primary productivity. All those uh, extra stems out there in the forest reduce our summer base flows. Um, and, and we you know, just can't see those streams get enough power to activate this, the stream channel. And then you know, we're left with this severe risk for large scale, high severity wildfires. Smoke also plays a role with stream temperatures here on the southern range of salmon habitat. Uh, you know, literally in some years we see fish jumping onto the rocks to get into the cold water of tributaries out of the main stem, like that picture on the right. Uh, in 2013, uh, uh, approximately 300 of our 700 remaining wild spring chinook salmon died that year uh, because of uh, heat induced stress. Now, ironically, uh, an arsonist drove up the Salmon River, up the main stem, and then up the North Fork here and started the 2013 Butler Fire in the 2013 Salmon River Complex. Uh, they actually passed me right there at Forks of Salmon, where you see the two forks come together. But the crazy thing was, um, after that smoke went in the air, the salmon stopped dying and the main stem cooled about six degrees C uh, for the rest of the summer until they were able to spawn. Uh, you know, what we're seeing here on the southern range of, of Chinook salmon and coho salmon is, is um, you know, it's, it's incredibly heartbreaking. You know, these fish are trying to get up, up the Klamath to the upper basin, you know, hopefully taking out the Klamath dams uh, changes that equation. But right now those fish are dead enders. You know, they end up in creeks like Clear Creek just beat up and and uh, you know, with very few chances of, of spawning successfully. And even in pristine rivers like the salmon, you know, the, the water temperatures get so high every summer that you, know, you go under ledges expecting to see these beautiful fish and you see rotting carcasses like this 30 pound male I found up at Boulder Gulch. And fires are changing. They're nothing like I remember as a, as a child, you know, the 2014 Whites Fire send up a 40,000 foot pyrocumulonimbus cloud that spread lightning uh, 70 miles to the north and spawned several other major wildfires that burned an extra 150,000 acres that summer at higher severities than normal. And then, you know, all that topsoil washes away into the rivers and, and the high flows and, and the whole productivity of the landscape is, is decreased. On September 8th, Black Tuesday, 2020, this is what we saw coming into Happy Camp. The Slater fire ended up burning about half the town. It burned 120,000 acres in one 24 hour period. It's roughly a 30 mile long by nine mile wide swath of high severity all the way into Oregon. Over 230 homes burned in the sustained 50 mile an hour east wind with 3% humidity. Three people died. An interesting thing is that, um, you know, it was an east wind, it was blowing towards the west. And if it wasn't for the 2018 eclipse fire footprint and the 2017 oak fire footprint, uh, my friend Lee Tarnay modeled that fire and said it would have likely burned down the town of Crescent City 50 miles to the west. If, if those footprints, fire footprints weren't there. You know, we luckily we were able to save some homes by slightly deflecting the, the fire up the hill and out of the, out of the canyon. 
but many people like Mickwick board member Dean Davis um, had no chance. He tried to stay and defend his mid slope home uh, that he had built uh, up over past 40 years and uh, luckily barely escaped with his life. Um, watching as everything burned down around him in a small meadow that he had done some prescribed burning around for a safety zone. You know, the amount of loss we're seeing due to wildfire is enormous. The amount of toxins that are washing away from these home sites that are burning with ever more regularity. It's incumbent upon all of us, including our, our fisheries biologists to come together to address this problem and to understand fire on the landscape. Now, what we know is that from recent fires like the Red Salmon Complex uh, that also burned in 2020, recent fire footprints like that 2013 Butler fire I talked about are slowing or stopping those burns even during high, high fire conditions while uh, burn scars over 10 years old are, are receptive to fire. And, and really what we've seen over uh, the times we've been tracking wildfires since the early 1900s is that you know, we had very few small scale fires in the early part of the century, but in the past couple decades, basically everywhere that hasn't burned is, is burning and it's burning at high severity and size and severity are definitely increasing. And in some cases like the Salmon River watershed, uh, I could update this figure and say, you know, roughly 70% of the watershed is burned in the past 10 years, much of it at high severity. Uh, now the key to understanding fire on our landscapes and, and in particular here in the Western Klamath Mountains is to look at fire overlaps. Now there's no place uh, that's even close to being with it, within its historic fire return interval or even close. Um, and this is a major press disturbance for salmon. Um, you know, fire should be a pulse disturbance, but fire suppression is a press disturbance that affects the whole landscape. You know, places where we might have seen 30 or 100 fire overlaps, where the Karuk tribe were ceremonially burning places like Ekaria Tuiuship, Afil Mountain every year. Um, this, this pattern of fire on overlapping fires on the landscape would look much different. Right now, we have one place, 0.1% of the landscape has seen five overlaps. It's an incredible change. And, and those overlapping fires were responsible for the incredible biodiversity we see here in the Klamath Mountains, which has the highest conifer diversity of anywhere in the world. Um, and, and those fires created um, spatial patterns in the vegetation that impeded large fire growth and also promoted uh, you know, water uh, sequestration. You can see here on this ridge near Happy Camp, the north side of the ridge is about a 50% canopy closure so the snow can fall and then be shaded and then release that water over time. The south side, the upper third of the slope is burned off hot and is a natural fuel break with large old growth trees down in the drainage. Um, and we can also look back to clues like this map of arson fires in Hoopa from 1931, which is actually a map of indigenous burning. And we can start to see those patterns of the, the red circles, the patch burning into last year's uh, prescribed or cultural burns and burns along ridges and along trail systems for hunting grounds and for basket material. Now, people like Nettie Rubin and, and Sandy Bar Bob understood fire on this landscape in a very intimate way. There's stories here in Orleans Valley where the men would burn on one side of the valley to lure the deer away from where the women were burning for basket materials on the other side of the valley to keep them from browsing those straight sticks. And, and that knowledge of fire translated into a cultural wealth that is reflected in the ceremonies that continue on to this day and was responsible for the incredible uh, diversity of cultural objects that sustained uh, tribal lifeways here along the Klamath River. Now those habitats that you know supported that culture are, have changed drastically in the past century. Places like Red Cap Glade where Laverne Glaze used to gather Bodia bulbs as a young girl are no longer on the landscape. They're just gone. They're just dense, mid-mature fur stands that burn at high severity. 
And similarly, looking upriver from Big Rock and this uh, time sequence that my friend Frank Lake put together for his dissertation, you can see, you know, the ridge lines trans uh, went from, you know, oaks and scattered uh, large firs to just a, a blanket of fur across the landscape. Over the past century, we've thrown literally tens of billions of dollars trying to bomb fire off this landscape. Uh, and, and the results are, are heartbreaking. You know, we're essentially maximizing the negative impacts of fire. Um, you know, 98% of all fire starts are suppressed. You know, the ones we suppress are the ones we should probably figure out how to let burn. Uh, and the ones that uh, you can't suppress are because they're the hottest, driest times of the year, which means greater risk to firefighters and communities and a greater proportion of that footprint being high severity. Um, you know, we're seeing hundreds of thousands of acres burn and spending tens and hundreds of millions of dollars trying to suppress these fires. And despite the devastating effects to fire dependent ecosystems and cultures, there's never been an environmental analysis of the effects of fire suppression. So for the past two decades, we've been working to create a social and cultural movement to change how we manage fire in the Klamath Mountains and throughout the West. Um, this means creating programs like the Community Liaison Program, the FireWise Program, Fire Adaptive Communities and Fire Learning Network Program, uh, standing up fire safe councils to engage our communities in, in being responsible for managing fire on the landscape. In 2013, we started the Western Climate Restoration Partnership, which brought together local, tribal, state and federal organizations um, to re-envision how we're managing the upslope and the interesting thing was that the trust for this effort was built from our, our, our efforts at collaborative in-stream restoration. And so we're looking at this um, 10 million, or 1.2 million acre landscape in the Western Klamath Mountains. And the cool thing was we came together around shared values uh, that everyone agreed to, the loggers, the preacher, the environmentalists, the tribal members, the agencies that we all supported sustainable local economies, cultural and community vitality, fire adapted communities, restored fire regimes, resilient biodiverse forests, plants, animals, and fish, and a healthy river system. And for us, that meant relearning how to use fire as a tool on the landscape and, and you know, confronting these obstacles that, that we had, uh, you know, had stopped us over time, like liability and insurance, air quality, burn permitting, having a trained workforce and having a community that accepted us putting smoke in the air. You know, our strategy is to start from the homes and work out to engage the homeowners in the process of burning their own lands and to empower them to have the tools to put fire back into recent fire footprints like the 2013 Orleans fire that nearly burned down the town of Orleans. And, you know, we came back into that footprint four years later and started burning in those high severity snag patches sometimes through the night uh, in order to reduce those fuels and to get that patchwork mosaic that we need. Uh, since 2014, when we started the Klamath Prescribed Fire Training Exchange, we burned over 3,500 acres on 200 plus properties in the wildland urban interface of seven communities. We've had over 600 participants from local, tribal, state, national, and federal organizations and people from around the world. And we've had no escape fires. And importantly, we've touched so many people with good fire. Um, and I'm excited to be working now with an incredible group of scientists and cultural knowledge holders modeling cultural fire regimes in the Klamath Mountains through the reburn model which basically runs fire on fire interactions over thousands of years with different, you know, cultural ignition patterns or suppression, you know, from no suppression to full suppression to grow out vegetation on the landscape and, and to evaluate and understand the historic conditions developed from a robust and culturally grounded framework and to quantify that landscape structure uh, and the cultural resource abundance uh, and, and the wildfire risk and carbon stocks and then the company with that is this pods or potential operational delineations model that identifies areas of fire risk and opportunity and, and allows fire managers to make shared risk decisions 
you know, say for managing some wildfires for resource objectives um, with the communities that are affected by those decisions. And so these are just some examples. The, the center tiles, you know, show how the vegetation changes, um, you know, from previous, uh, those studies you see on the left from the tripod fire and the Kootenai and the East Zone fires of, you know, what it would look like, you know, had no suppression actions been taken to the vegetation. And, and that really lines up with both, you know, cultural knowledge, as well as this paper from Anderson and Barber in 2020 or 2002, you know, this is what the tribal elders talk about the forest looking like in that red box, you know, uh, a lot more sun hitting the ground for the, the berries and the, 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 the um, bulbs and uh, the deer and the elk and, and much larger old growth trees that are fire resilient. So these pods that we're currently, you know, vetting with the public and, and tribes and state and federal agencies are a, a critical step towards re-envisioning how, how we manage fires on our landscapes. And, and perhaps these pod models have been done for your landscape. And I encourage you to engage in that, you know, because the reality is we need to start living with wildfire. Uh, this is where I live at Butler Flat on the Salmon River. You know, my greatest threat after having wildfires burn all around us in, in sequential years uh, from starting in 2006 and then doing prescribed fire after, is that if they continue to suppress fire on this landscape. So we need managed wildfire to protect us over time combined with prescribed fire in the front country. I'm super excited to be working now on, on our next WKR project, WKRP project to um, treat 9,000 acres around Offield Mountain, Ikaria Tuisha, um, to make space for uh, the restoration of one of the, the final Karuk ceremonies that hasn't been restored. At the end of Pikyavish, at the new moon in September, they would light the top of Offield Mountain and that fire would broadcast out to the landscape. Now, if we get to a place where we can do that again, you know, we will have restored that human fire relationship and when we, we will have restored uh, our, our river processes as well. So I invite you guys all to join me on this journey. You know, the reality is a uh, ceremony is not something us white folks do very well, but the survival of salmon depend on us learning those lessons. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, I wish I was there with all of you.